Nope. Good morning. Okay. I'll just go ahead and let everyone in then, Jim, and we'll get started. Does that make sense to you, or do you want to hang that's on a few more minutes? No, I think that sounds perfect. Thank you so much. And I'll let you do the intro, and then yep. whenever you hand it to me, I'll take it over. Thanks so much. Great. Yep, absolutely. Looking forward to this, guys. Thanks. All right. Well, welcome, everyone, to Church of the Epiphanies Islam 101 class. This is our third and final session, and we're so grateful today, especially to have some special guests with us on a panel. Um, there are some folks here gathered in this room, some of them on camera, some of them off, but I don't have quite the right lens of going to capture the whole audience here, but we are both in person and on Zoom, and want to just offer just a special thanks to our panel for being here today, and our own parishioner, Dr. Jim Posteroy, will introduce them in a second. Um, Jim, as you many of you know, is the um, is a professor at Emory School of Religion and is a cultural am anthropologist who has studied Islam for many years now. And we're just so thrilled to have his expertise um, with us this morning and throughout this series as we look towards um, engaging more deeply in our community, especially with the Ismaili community here in Decatur. All right, Jim, you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Nicole. And thank you to everybody for joining us in person on Zoom. Um, such a pleasure. And this has been such a, a wonderful, so, so wonderful to be part of this series and especially the three kind of sessions we've had. The first one on a kind of introduction to Islam. The second one specifically on Islam in America with Professor Womack. And then now third, uh, my favorite of the three weeks is when we get a chance to meet some of our Muslim brothers and sisters um, and learn from their perspectives, their experiences. You know, as you remember from the first week of our seminar, and I said, you know, the statistics from Pew Research Center suggest that over half of Americans don't know a Muslim. And when I ask those questions in, in public, I usually get about half. And then I say, but how many have really have a friend who's Muslim? And those numbers go down even further. And so for me, it's a wonderful bridging of two worlds today. Um, every time I ask those questions, I'm always grateful for the friends, the colleagues, the students, um, the peers, um, the neighbors who, who are my Muslim friends in, in various locations I've lived from Indonesia to with my wife Kristen's research in Tanzania. And so it's, it's a great pleasure to, to kind of introduce them today and, and learn from their experiences, invite us all to learn from their experiences that are very different. And so um, if it's okay, I'll just introduce everybody right now and then we'll go, um, we'll go in order. Um, and I, I think we're, uh, Rahim John, if you're here, let me know. I can't see everybody in the, um, in the display yet. Um, so what I will do first is I would like to introduce um, Lean Fina an Indonesian who's here studying in the U.S., doing her Ph.D. in uh, Islam, or religious studies or Islamic studies, working on specifically um, women or kind of feminist interpretations of the Quran as a way to kind of combat against patriarchal readings of the Quran. Um, one connection with Emory here is that we tried our hardest to try and recruit her and bring her as a Ph.D. student, um, and she's in a wonderful place at University of Chicago, um, and I'll look forward to inviting Lean to speak. Um, after that, I'll ask Sahil Gilani. Sahil Gilani is a graduate of Emory University, and I had the pleasure to be on his honors thesis and to have him in a couple of my courses. Sahil um, is from the Ismaili background and in his honors thesis did a whole interesting project on the difference between Sunni uh, and Shia Muslims and the way in which those differences were formed in, in kind of political context, not always religious contexts. As we talked about before, sometimes we look for religion when maybe we should see politics. So Sahil will join us after that and give us some perspectives about his own work. And he works at Capital Relief Services in Dallas now. And so I've invited him to talk about the idea of SAFA or service um, and his own experiences um, within the Ismaili community and then interfaith. And then Liri Carrero, a just fantastic friend and colleague who was the former executive director of the National of Komnas Prempuan, the National Commission on Violence Against Women in Indonesia and served at least, correct me if I'm wrong, at least a five-year term um, and is now executive director of the Alliance for Peaceful Indonesia 
um, and also faculty member at the University of Indonesia uh, and UNS University of Indonesia in Jakarta. Rahim John Abdugapurov, um, if he may be joining us a little bit late. He may be having a couple of technical issues. Um, was a former PhD student here at Emory um, from Uzbekistan. So brings even a different perspective on Islam. Um, and he was going to share with us kind of interfaith relations in Uzbekistan itself. Um, he and his wife both got their PhDs here at Emory. Um, and just a, a fantastic student and kind of representative um, of his Muslim tradition, both intellectually and in the kind of everyday embodiment as we talked about Adab. So with that, um, I just wanted to give brief introductions and please, I will hand it over to Lean. And after that, Sahil, feel free to go. And then Bariri. And then if Rahim John is, is with us or joins us later, then, then he'll invite us. Um, I will just as a reminder to try, I've tried to ask each person as tough as this is to keep it to about eight minutes. Um, I'll come in right at 10 minutes and I'll forgive me beforehand stop just in the hopes of having a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. And so with that, uh, Limpina, please join us and thank you for being with our community today. Thank you so much, by Jim, for you know, the invitation. And thank you everyone for having me. It's nice to meet all of you and I'm delighted to share my story to everyone here. Um, uh, Right now, I'm studying at the University of Chicago, but I have shifted like my research. Uh, I am learning the reception of the Quran in the modern time, especially among Sufi communities in Indonesia. But today, I will not, uh, you know, talk about that. I would like to share a story about um, how Muslim kids and teenagers receive their education when they grow up, and I will use my story as as an example. And by that, I don't mean that my story is, is a reflective of all Muslim kids and teenagers in Indonesia, but, but at least, you know, my story would, would reflect some of them or some of their stories. So I grew up in a small town in East Java, in the island of Java, and to my family, Islam is very important. And the pattern of my education since kindergarten till university life has been like this. So basically in the morning, I went to formal public schools, you know, in the elementary school, senior, junior, and then undergrad. And then in the afternoon or evening, I attended Quran school or madrasa or Islamic schools. When I was around five, my parents sent me to the Quran school only half a mile away from our home. So in the morning, I went to kindergarten. And then in the afternoon, around 4 p.m., I had a shower, dressed nicely, and went to the mosque, you know, walking or riding my bike to learn how to read the Quran. It started with learning Arabic alphabets, and gradually I learned how to read the Quran itself. By learning how to read or recite the Quran, I don't mean learning to understand its meaning, but to pronounce the words in Arabic. So the Quran is believed to be the word of God, and reciting the Qur'an is a form of recommended worship. Through this act of recitation, Muslims embody the word of God through its sound and energy, and hopefully it instills good character. So maintaining or a uh, good relationship with the Qur'an is not necessarily through understanding its meaning, but through reciting you know, the words in Arabic. And other than learning how to read the Qur'an, I also learned how to pray. As you might have been you know, familiar, Muslims are recommended to, or commanded actually, like it's ob obligatory to pray five times a day. So I learned how to perform ritual ablutions before prayers, prayers movement, what is recited and so on and so on in this mosque. So learning to recite the Quran and to perform prayer is a stable education for Muslim kids. And not only in school, my parents also taught this at home. It is in fact at home that I learned uh, how to pray uh, for the first time, like through through seeing my parents did it. Um, you know, since I was a toddler, my parents would include me uh, in, in their daily prayers and I began to imitate uh, some of the movements since very early. And and when when I was around, let's say seven, uh, they are, my parents are the ones who make sure that I pray five times a day. Like, okay, it's time to pray, it's time to pray, go. Like, take your ablution and pray. So, so they are the ones who make sure that I, I, you know, I do the commanded or the obligatory prayers. In the evening, I also read the Quran before my mom and dad. So education at home is very important and they will help me to cor correct my pronunciation. 
I also went to madrasa to learn Islamic sciences, uh, fiqih or Islamic law from which I learned obligatory or recommended forms of prayers and how to perform them. So besides five times a day, there are other recommended prayers. Besides fasting for the whole month in the month of Ramadan that I believe you've been familiar, um, which is obligatory, this, this, fast, uh, you know, this fasting in the month of Ramadan, there are other commanded series of fasting, you know, weekly like, or monthly. So, so there are different forms of fast, fasting. Also, I learned that paying alms is an obligation that um, there are rights of the needy in, in our wealth. I also learned a subject called Aqidah or Islamic doctrine uh, in which I learned what it means to believe in God. Also, I learned Akhlaq or Islamic ethics, which is very important, especially in early education. And from attending this madrasa to, during my childhood since, since early on, I learned the importance of being respectful to parents, teachers, older people, uh, to be kind to people, to be merciful to the younger I also learned the etiquette or manner of seeking knowledge. Uh, that seeking knowledge is not a matter of cultivating cognitive intelligence per se, but more importantly, seeking knowledge is about embodying that knowledge and applying it in our daily lives. So I learned uh, that as much as it is important to accumulate you know, more knowledge, as I mentioned earlier, it is more important to, to obtain uh, embodied knowledge and knowledge that is baroka. So baroka is from an Arabic word, literally means an increase of goodness, but it is usually translated as blessed. Uh, so blessed knowledge. And baroka is not only signifying, uh, signifying uh, knowledge, but also wealth, health, um, you know, life, you name it. But basically baroka is a very central concept in, in Islamic community where I grew up. Uh, that it's important that you uh, you 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 strive to uh, to obtain baroka uh, knowledge that is baroka or blessed knowledge and this um, and 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 I was taught uh, during this madrasa you know training that a blessed knowledge is obtained through you know settling good intention respecting teachers as the carriers of the knowledge and that is expressed even physically by your gesture like when I'm in front of my teacher I would do this for example like I wouldn't like stand up like this but I would uh, you know I would have a certain gesture as a sign of respect uh, to them and not talking ill about your teacher studying hard etc well of course these are hard uh, I and and of course by mentioning this I don't mean that I have mastered all of this uh, you know etiquette but but at least I have learned the ideal and, and that I'm, I'm, I'm striving to, to meet that ideal. Also, I learned hadith, the recorded, say, the recorded sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, the history of Islam, especially uh, the history of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, so that we could emulate you know, his character. Um, later on, the subject edit. So I, I, I told you that in, in the afternoon, since my kindergarten until university life, I went to madrasa in the afternoon and evening. Uh, so later on, the subjects added Islamic spirituality, history of Islamic civilization, Arabic interpretation of the Quran. And the older I got, the more advanced texts I read for each subject. So it started from like the basic, uh, but then went up to, to more complicated texts. So that's basically the summary. Um, and if you ask me what I experienced differently when I pursue my study here in the U.S., I would say that, you know, there is a rather different conception of what knowledge and seeking knowledge is. Also that the concept of baroka, you know, the importance of having knowledge that is baroka, blessed knowledge, uh, is not necessarily present here. So, yeah, that's all, everyone. And I would love to uh, hear from your comments and, you know, questions uh, in the end of, 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 you know, this session. Thank you. And I'll return to, to uh, Pat, Jim. Thank you, Matlin, so much for sharing the kind of the, the broader approaches to Islamic education and really what it's like for, for kids in, in Muslim countries or Muslim areas in terms of recitation. And I loved what you said about the act of recitation itself is, um, is worship. Um, and I'll just add a little bit on the idea of blessings that knowledge is, is considered blessing. So you're right, in the West, sometimes our knowledge gets secularized. Um, and I would add that one of the things that I admire within the Islamic tradition also is that money, you can have reziki or fortune without it being blessed fortune or baroka, 
So for our my friends here at the Epif Church of the Epiphany, um, if you make money by illicit means, um, then it, it does not count for you. In fact, it counts against you. And so there's a whole ethics of investment, capitalism, et cetera, also within Islamic traditions that I think sometimes gets misunderstood when there's the kind of fearful monikers of Sharia out there. So thank you so much. And with that, I really welcome uh, Gilani back to Atlanta, even if only, or Sahil back to Atlanta, if only uh, virtually. So Sahil, thanks for joining us. Um, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sahil. Uh, Sahil is actually the right pronunciation. So that's awesome that uh, Dr. H still remembers that. Um, so I have grown up in the uh, Ismaili community, as Dr. H mentioned. Uh, this is a particular subsect of Shia Islam. Um, we, um, I, I wanted to share a quote that, that would really kind of um, bring to light the, um, the social guidelines that, that we are um, socialized with at, at an early age. And like Lean mentioned, uh, through what we call, I guess, religious education centers or RECs is just a, a westernized term for the madrasas. Um, um, and so we learn um, that the din and the dunya are inseparable, uh, which so din means uh, faith and dunya means world. And so our faith um, kind of is the um, guiding moral compass or we live our ethics um, every day, which includes service or seva. Um, and so that's kind of the um, culture or environment that I've grown up in. And that shaped my professional life. Um, and so currently I am a director over refugee services department at Catholic Charities Dallas, like Dr. H mentioned. So I oversee the resettlement of newly arrived refugees um, to the Dallas area. Um, and so, uh, so the quote that I, I wanted to kind of mention is, um, the, the following, voluntary service to others is viewed as an integral part of daily life in, this, in the Ismaili tradition, never as a burdensome obligation or an elective activity. And I've, I've really grown to internalize that um, as, as a young child. Uh, so I never saw it as an extra, extracurricular or something just to put on my resume, uh, but to really live that and to care for God's creation and to try to leave, leave behind the world a better place than I found it in. Um, and so everything that I've, I've done from, from that point on um, to my professional life, and it's so amazing that I can kind of blend my passion and profession uh, as well as my faith into um, doing, doing this every day kind of um, and um, so, so uh, in, in our tradition, like I mentioned, uh, youth are socialized to see uh, volunteer service as an important part of everyday life. And they're given opportunities in Jamatkanas, which is our, our place of prayer, uh, as well as it's also a community center. Um, so for example, we have uh, various meetings there. Uh, so we would have, for REC, for example, uh, the opportunities that they received are, are uh, similar to like uh, secular schools. So there's student councils uh, where you can receive leadership opportunities There's volunteerism uh, and given like small tasks, uh, for example, um, a shoes company, for example, uh, of, of Jamaica. So like we take off our shoes when we go into our prayer hall. And so uh, kiddos will take shoes and then give a little token uh, to the uh, person. And then once prayer time is done, uh, the person gives them a token and uh, they'll give them their shoes from, from the shoe rack. Uh, and so little tasks like this uh, really kind of inculcate uh, the spirit of, of seva or service. Um, and then not only to the community, but that's just a, a, a stepping stone, if you will, and then that leads to external service opportunities um, and outreach uh, opportunities. So I'm, I'm guessing that's that's uh, what Jim or, or Dr. H. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I call him Dr. H. I, I heard Jim earlier. Um, 
You can so, call me Jim now. You you gra- you graduated. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll still call you Dr. H. Um, so um, so that kind of leads them into those external opportunities, and that might be that that tree project uh, that Dr. H was was referring to. Um, and so, not only is it inculcated um, by um, those fundamental aspects of Islam within Islam, um, but it's also with positive role models and examples. So our religious leader is called the Aga Khan, and he kind of lives this uh, sense of service in, in his daily life, in his, um, in his philanthropic work, uh, not only with our community, but other communities at large. So th- there is the Aga Khan Development Network, which is AKDN. Uh, so that is a nonprofit organ- uh, organization that has various different branches. Uh, so he has uh, like um, Aga Khan hospitals and universities and Aga Khan uh, uh, Focus, uh, which helps with humanitarian aid. Um, and so these have kind of all with, with the um, kind of formal scriptures as well as uh, positive role models and, and their experiences or leading by example have kind of led me to what I do now. And um, I love religion. Uh, so I wanted to share another quote with you guys because uh, I, I don't get to do this a lot. Um, so it's, um, <clears throat> oh, mankind, fear your Lord who created you of a single soul and from it created the mate and from the pair of them scattered abroad, many men and women. I know of no more beautiful expression about the unity of human race born indeed from a single soul. Um, and so I love like pluralism and bringing together uh, different cultures, different faiths uh, and kind of emphasizing the commonalities of, of all of them and how we all are interleaked in um, and I am mindful of, of time here uh, as well um, on how we all have uh, similar social callings, if, if you will. And so caring for God's creation uh, is, is, is a theme linked uh, across Islam and Christianity, Judaism, um, and all the major world uh, religions. And so, for example, if you, if you look at the uh, corporal works of, of mercy, right, uh, at least three of them, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, sheltering the homeless. Uh, those are also aspects that we hold true in, in Islam. And, and so uh, we believe that um, you also have responsibility, a social obligation to uh, uh, care for that neighbor, um, aspects that Christianity um, ha- has as well. And so I love working for Catholic Charities that was as um, the values of Catholic social teaching kind of enmesh um, my values uh, as well, uh, irrespective of, of religion. Um, so with that being said, I'm at eight mark at, at the eight point. Um, and I just wanted to share one more quote with you. Um, if our animosities are born out of fear, then confident generosity is born out of hope. One of the central lessons I have learned after a century of working in the developing world is that the replacement of fear by hope is probably the single most powerful trampoline of human progress. The actual process of replacing fear with hope rests with every individual in his or her society, and they can become an, enor- in the, uh, sorry, an enormous source of growing strength and reassurance for one another. I hope that will happen to you. Uh, and that's a quote from Aga Khan. So that, that kind of is how I aim to live, live my life is um, through kind of service to others and um, giving them hope um, in, in terms of resettling them, rebuilding their lives here after all of the calamities back home. Um, and so, yeah, with that being said, I will hand it back to Dr. H. I know, thank you so much. Um, it's just great to hear your perspectives on this and to see, having known you for so long, I think it was my first year at Emory um, when you were in our Islam media pop culture course. 
For and, sure. you know, just, just to see you grow both a, at Emory over those next few years and then now professionally in a way, um, you know, as, as you know, and as I shared with, with our, our congregation a couple of weeks ago, um, one of my dissertation writing partners was doing a project on SAFA, on service within the Ismaili community from based on a year and a half of work in, in Mumbai. And so um, it's helpful for our community as we embark on this interfaith journey with the Ismaili community to, to know that about uh, the Jamar Khanna and to also think about service. And I especially appreciate the way in which, as we think about the ecological po possibilities for for interfaith volunteer work and activism in the ecological side of being something that across um, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam is, is always revered as, as humans as a kind of responsibility and, and as a kind of viceroys of the planet, but also ones that in the Islamic eschatological tradition, um, we have to account for when we die. And so thank you. I yeah. would also add, you know, one of the things that I always, that I was not able to add in our week one, because uh, we just, there's so many things to try and put in there. But as you were speaking, I was thinking about the passage from Al-Hujrat in, in Al-Quran, in the Holy Quran, where it says, um, God created nations and tribes specifically, so and, and religions, ethnicity, so that you can get to know each other. Yep. And that the greatest of those is the one who is kind of most pious or God-fearing and um, that idea of collaboration is built into the Islamic tradition also. So I just wanted to flag that for our congregation here. So thanks for pointing to those similarities um, yeah, without no, erasing the differences. For sure. Thanks, thanks for mentioning that. Um, and, and yeah, so God's creation is not just other, other people, uh, but like Dr. H mentioned, it's, it's all of God's creation. So it's nature. Um, and so, um, and the effects of, of, of that. So the ecological um, would, would definitely be one of them as well. Well, thank you. And now it's my pleasure to hand it over to Riri Carrero, um, a friend and colleague, interlocutor. We were we, both um, have been impressed by her work in Indonesia before I got to know her when she was already executive director of the National Commission on Violence Against Women, um, and then have been fortunate to share a uh, a virtual stage on a couple of Zoom conferences recently. So thank you also, Mariri, for joining us, yeah. giving us your time and sharing your expertise. Go right ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pat Jim, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's an honor for me to be in the congregation, in the congregation this morning. <laughs> Since in Jakarta, it's like almost 10 at night. So yeah, I'm so happy to be here with you. Uh, but Jim told me that uh, I don't need to, you know, like speak in academic way. So I will just share my experience as a women's rights activist, as well as a mother with uh, three kids. And how we live here in Jakarta as a, a Muslim family. So I prepared some pictures. So uh, let me uh, share screen for you. Okay. Can can you see? Yes. Can you see it very that's well? Cool. That's great. We can see it now. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So my name is Riri Harira. You can call me uh, Riri. Uh, I grew up in small uh, town in Jaffa, and uh, after graduated from Islamic University, then I moved to Jakarta to uh, get works in uh, NGO in Jakarta. Uh, basically, I would I would love to call myself as a women's rights advocate. Uh, uh, I'm really proud to say that I'm a Muslim feminist uh, who really work on uh, tackling uh, the gender-based violence and also uh, discrimination against women based on the uh, Islamic uh, framework. So I believe that uh, in the Quran and also in the Hadith of the Prophet that provide uh, a solid ground for a women to be equal uh, as a human being and also uh, teach us how to uh, respect each other and how to alleviate uh, discrimination and uh, violence uh, uh, on the basis of uh, gender or race or ethnicity. Yes, uh, during uh, my activism, I used to be a commissioner in the National Commission 
on anti-violence against women. This is the Human Rights Commission in Indonesia that uh, focus on how to uh, develop uh, women's rights in Indonesia and how to build a conducive situation in Indonesia uh, in order to uh, alleviate uh, gender-based violence. And after that, uh, I work as executive director in the Alliance of Peaceful Indonesia that uh, now I'm working with uh, former terrorists, of course, who already engage from violence and already go back to the peaceful ways, as well as with the victims of uh, terrorists, how both of this group now collaborate to uh, become messenger of peace. So we do a lot of uh, campaign uh, in Indonesia, especially in among the Muslim youth uh, in schools and also in uh, campus, as well as among religious leaders in Indonesia. Besides that, I also lecture at the National Nahdlatul Ulama University Indonesia. Nahdlatul Ulama is one of the biggest Muslim organization in Indonesia, might be also in the world, because the member of NU is uh, around 90 million. And uh, Pak Jim is all, one of the prolific uh, researcher who very close with us in the uh, among the NU uh, uh, circle. I uh, Beside that, uh, uh, I also do community works in Fatayat NU. Fatayat NU is... Um, the women wings of NU that also strive for uh, a gender equality within Islamic framework. So day to day, I receive uh, cases from the victims of gender-based violence, and uh, I do uh, spiritual as well as uh, psychological counseling uh, for the victims. And we also built some referral system that uh, to help the victims uh, to address their uh, cases. Yeah. So, uh, uh, as you know, that actually I also uh, uh, studied in Ohio University a long time ago, 10 years ago. So I did my master degree in Ohio University in Athens, small town in Ohio. Uh, this is some pictures. Actually, this is one of the most memorable life yeah, for me. Yeah, I went there with my husband and with my small kid. But then uh, in the second year, I delivered my baby in Athens. So <laughs> basically, I'm an uh, American mother. You can say that because, uh, yeah, my, my, my daughter, my daughter is uh, born in Ohio and uh, she holds a U.S. passport. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so this is some of activism that I can share with you that uh, uh, during my term as a commissioner, uh, I represent um, Indonesia in, in many, uh, organi in, in many events uh, in the UN and also in ASEAN in other countries to share like our experience in Indonesia, how the situation of uh, women, Muslim women in Indonesia, and how we address uh, the cases of uh, gender-based violence. And uh, I also uh, uh, do uh, a lot of work with uh, government agencies in Indonesia, especially how to, uh, uh, to build awareness and also how to, uh, to, how to uh, encourage them to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, the 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 policies in place that uh, not discriminate against women or or against minority uh, groups. So I, I work a lot with uh, church communities, especially when there are a lot of challenges to build church in several places in Indonesia. So we did uh, advocate uh, uh, with them to build a church, and also we work with some minority. Uh, groups within Muslim communities, for example, like a Shiite Shi Shi community and also the Ahmadiyah community who have been uh, experiencing uh, some uh, violence in Indonesia uh, because this is a uh, uh, human rights uh, uh, commission. So we uh, do some advocacy to make sure that, uh, the, the, that the, the state really protect 
uh, and also guarantee the right of uh, minorities in Indonesia. So since my gene is women activist, so even though I'm not commissioner right now, I, also, I still work uh, in the context of a uh, Muslim feminist uh, movement in Indonesia. So I work a lot with the women's ulama and also with the women activists, be it from the Muslim background um, or from secular background to uh, advocate uh, the policies that, uh, 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 policies that uh, uh, tackle gender-based violence and, and also protect the uh, minority groups uh, in Indonesia. So this is my family. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. so this is, uh, yeah, uh, I have son and two daughters. So this is uh, Sophia that was born in uh, Athens. She is now 10 years old. Uh, yeah, because we, we went back to Indonesia in 2010. So yeah, as Muslim uh, family, we try to, you know, balance between a spiritual foundation and, and also, of course, just like other family that we want to have like very harmonious life in society, uh, in, in, the, in, in, in our household. So yeah, during the weekend, like by gym, like taking care of uh, her kid to soccer. We also, in the weekend, we do, we do cycling and we went to a coffee shop. Sometime we also went to the cinema. Yeah, just, just like other uh, family who really want to have like a very uh, close relationship with the kids. Yeah, and, and I myself also train uh, my kid to read the Quran and also, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to support them and to help them understand what uh, Islam uh, teach us and how to be a good Muslim since uh, the beginning. And yeah, <laughs> and this is my husband. My husband is actually... Uh, uh, his name is Ali. He is actually a uh, mosque activist. So if you guys, there is a church activist. So my husband is actually mosque activist. Basically, he worked a lot with the mosque community in Indonesia. So uh, he provide, you know, like a scholarship from for the uh, orphans and also help help some you know areas that experience nat natural dis disasters for example and also preach in uh, in mosque but because uh, he is actually motivator so sometime during his preaching he, he he looks like motivator rather than as islamic uh, preachers yeah so <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. So he 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 has a vision that actually mosque is not only a place for uh, uh, for worship, but this is a place for community that uh, you can build uh, economic community. You can help uh, your neighbor and also the members uh, from you know from some uh, problem, for example, from poverty and helping the orphan. So taking care of each other uh, within the mosque uh, community. And this is my son. Uh, she, uh, she is, uh, uh, he is uh, 14 years old, and now uh, she is, uh, uh, he is studying in Pesantren. Pesantren is Islamic uh, boarding school, yeah, in Central Java. So usually, a parent in Indonesia who are uh, uh, coming from like religious family, then uh, they send their kids, uh, their, their, their son or their daughter to, to Pesantren to study Islamic sciences, but as well as they have to study like modern uh, sciences. So my son, uh, uh, see, uh, he is he like science a lot. So uh, within in the Pesantren, he joined uh, for example, like uh, 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 like uh, math championship and also a science championship, and 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 luckily uh, uh, he is a good in, in science. So yeah, so basically he want to be a scientist, and he want actually he want to work at Boeing. So I wait, wait. I don't know Boeing. You uh, is it pronounced correctly, uh, by James? Yeah, it's Boeing. Yeah, it's the plane. Boeing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He said that he want to work at like a Boeing company. He want to build like a plane. Yeah, <laughs> and this is uh, the girls who were who were who was born in Ohio. So we give we give a name. Atina. Atina is actually coming from Athens. Yeah, Atina Sophia. Yeah. So I sent her to Islamic schools. 
uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but besides that, during his during her spare time, he, because she liked painting, so she did a lot of uh, painting, especially during the pandemic. So beside her schedule uh, uh, with the online tutorials during the pandemic, uh, so uh, she did uh, a lot of uh, paint uh, painting at at home. And the last one, this is uh, Sharifa. Sharifa mean noble, yeah. Yeah, so like Muslim in uh, like parent Indonesia always uh, give their name usually coming from like Arabic word. Yeah, uh, Sharifa means uh, noble. So uh, she want to be like when I ask her what is what what do, what do you want to be later, uh, and she she replied that I, I want to be a model. I want, <laughs> you want to be, she want to be like an actor an actor, an actress, yeah? So like every morning, yeah, after taking a bath, uh, she always like dress up and then ask me to get like some, to, to get her like some pictures, yeah. So I think that's all. So uh, this is like very, you know, like daily and mundane uh, stories uh, for me as, uh, as a mother with three kids and, and also as a Muslim feminist in Indonesia. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Mbak Riri. There's nothing, there's nothing such as a mundane story when we're, when we're meeting people. You know, and when I was talking with Riri about what she should present, I said, well, of course, I would love to see, have them hear about your professional work as a Muslim feminist. But also, I think one of the gifts of these kind of panels is that we get to see people's families. Like, we get to see painters like little Sophia, Athena Sophia. We get to see... You know your kid and i of course know a little bit more of you know your kids being away and 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 with your husband ali and it's just wonderful to meet each of you sahil lean and and really and unfortunately rahim john i don't believe has been able to join us um it would have been wonderful to meet him but now this and if rahim john if for some reason i'm not seeing you in the participant list feel free to chime in and tell me i'm wrong um but at this point why don't we turn it over um perhaps for questions and answers. And, you know, um, although there's many ways to do it and there's chat functions, et cetera, I think in this setting, it might be nice if people don't mind, just introduce yourself um, and we can open it up for questions of any sort. And then I will follow Reverend Nicole's lead um, in terms of when we wrap it up, because I know around uh, probably by 11, 05, 11, 10, um, it'll be, be closed. So thank you so much to each of you. And I will um, open it up for questions and answers, and maybe even invite uh, Reverend Nicole to, um, if you're at the main computer, to moderate um, that, if you can see it a bit easier than from mine. So please. Yes, of course. So I think if folks have questions in the room here, if you want to come around to the side of the TV, you could ask a question there because then they can see you on the screen and we can see you too. So thank you all so much for being here. We're, we're just so thrilled. Is there anyone who has a question online or in person? Hi, this is Erin, and I wanted to thank you all so much for spending time with us. It's been wonderful to hear your stories and to learn more about what you do. Thank you for all your good work. Um, I'm curious, it's probably hard to answer this, but I'm, I'd like to hear from your perspective what you would like us to know that um, about your faith and um, work in the world. Um, to help dispel common misperceptions. Um, I think there are many misperceptions in America, and I'm curious what might be your most, the most troubling misperceptions that you see at play in the United States. And I don't really have a, you know, if any of you would like to answer that or. Can I jump in on that? Please. Okay. Yeah, I, I forget to mention because uh, this is, uh, there are some, you know, like a very, uh, some uh, impression when I studied in the, uh, in, in Ohio that I received a lot of question about why I wear the hijab. Yeah, like, <laughs> because wearing hijab like this in Indonesia is uh, pretty common. Yeah, it's like 
yeah, it's like a, like every day, every day, uh, every day uh, dress code. But when I went to US, I got a lot of a uh, lot of question, like from my friends in in campus, but sometimes also with the people uh, there in Ohio when we go to the mall or we we do some uh, uh, some. Um, uh, uh, shopping in the market, and sometimes, especially during the 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 summer, people ask me, "Is it not hot we're wearing like that?" Yeah, so because it's summer, you know. But why are you still like wearing wearing hijab like that? Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, uh and and after I got like question like that, I really think actually about uh why I wear the hijab because I wear the hijab like this since. Uh, since I was a kid, because uh, I, uh, I I went to to uh, Islamic school for the whole of my life, and this is the this is the uniform that I wear. Uh, so I never question about that. But when I went to US, then I start you know like uh, looking and also understanding about what is uh, the meaning uh, for Muslim women by wearing the hijab, and. Yeah, and, and some misconception that I found that uh, 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 some friends still think that actually uh, uh, Muslim women wearing hijab because of the pressure from their family. Yeah, so because from, from the husband and from the father and sometimes it's also a symbolize of, uh, you know, of a subjugation of uh, women. Yeah, and in fact, when we ask like women who wear hijab, uh, if you ask like ten people, ten women in Indonesia, where are you wearing hijab? And you will got like ten answer. Yeah, because yeah, because there is no <laughs> there is no single uh, uh, answer about that. Yeah, uh, some women believe that this is uh, uh, required by our faith, but uh, some others say that this is uh, uh, this is not. So this is a, a matter of choice for women, whether for Muslim women, whether they want to wear hijab or not. So because the Quran says, uh, uh, actually, this is not the hijab that required, but how to dress like modestly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so 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 that basically the 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 spirit of the uh, hijab. Yeah, but some of, of course, some of the uh, fundamentalists or like more conservative groups always say that uh, it is obligatory for women to wear hijab because this is aura. Aura means that something that you cannot see by uh, your non uh, family. And sometimes they went far, you know, like they see that niqab, yeah, niqab or, or, or like you see like. Uh, many in a uh, Middle Eastern country is also part of uh, of the Islamic uh, prescribed. But uh, for me myself, I believe that actually uh, uh, that what Islam say is like for Muslim women is how to uh, dress modestly, and and uh, hijab is actually uh, symbolize uh, your surrender to your God, and this is really a matter of choice that no one can you know, force you whether you want to don hijab uh, or uh, not. I think that's uh, uh, some of, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say misconception, misconception. I would say that maybe this is because they don't know. They don't, they don't know about like uh, the, the, the Muslim culture and they don't have like friends of, of Muslims. So this is usually perpetuated by you know, the uh, news in the media that always portray uh, Muslim women as uh, oppressive. I think that's, uh, thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to share is uh, just the fact that Islam shares so many commonalities with Christianity. Um, and so a lot of times uh, the media doesn't portray uh, commonalities, but differences. Um, but I, I, I really wanted to emphasize just the commonalities of the fact that um, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism all, are all three Abrahamic faiths. And so we actually, um, Muslims, do recognize Jesus as a prophet and, um, and also the Bible. Um, and we believe that Islam is just a continuation. And that's why there's so many central messages that are the same in Islam as Christianity um, and um, Judaism as, as well. 
Um, so that's kind of just what I wanted to um, mention is just the fact that it, um, not only with Jesus or the Bible, but also Mary um, or um, commandments. And as I was speak, uh, talking, like the uh, the corporal acts of, of service or uh, Catholic social teaching, for example, uh, those themes kind of um, uh, cross religions. Um, and, 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 and so, um, yeah, uh, that's what I wanted to mention. There's a lot of similarities uh, between the, the two faiths. I might want to add like two things um, similar to Riri Hariro's experience. I remember when I was doing my master here in the United States around 2014, I got several questions about like some people went, actually I went to, you know, I, I was invited to speak in a church as well. And, and like, I got some questions in this church as well as in other contexts about, you know, uh, Islam being discriminatory to women. Um, some of them were, you know, some people were really shocked that um, my husband allowed me or my parents allowed me to uh, pursue a study far away from home. Uh, at that time, uh, my husband was still in Indonesia and I was um, here because uh, he had to, to do some work. At, uh, he, he had his, a job in Indonesia. So I think uh, because of the portrayal of the media, I think it's very important that we have such kind of this conversation, you know, you get to know us and we got to know you uh, so that we could, uh, you, we, we could have uh, some, some like, different pictures of what the media showed uh, about uh, Muslim women in Islam. Of course, like Islam, just like any other religion, any other communities, there are different uh, interpretations, different ways of, uh, you know, applying, performing, observing Islams in, in daily lives, different understandings of what hijab mean, what um, being religious mean, what uh, Islamic ethics mean, um, as well as the idea of, you know, besides the idea of uh, Islam is being discriminatory of women, uh, the idea that Islam is vi a violent religion, again, just like any other religions or any other ideologies, communities, that you know, Islam is an idea, and that it is, you know, a human being that uh, interprets it. And some might use some verses in the Quran or even in the Bible to uh, act against humanity, um, or some use them and reinterpret them in order to uh, maintain peaceful life with other human beings. And I think when we come to the issue of uh, women in Islam and the issue of Islam being a violent religion, it's also important to see it in light of like geopolitical issue. Like it's not only the, the variables that we need to uh, take into account is not only women and Islam or like uh, violence and Islam, but also like the, 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 the bigger context uh, so that we, we could, we, we are able to see the bigger picture and, and, and have more variables in order to understand why such an understanding comes into being. Uh, and so on and so on. Yeah, I think that's what I wanted to add by Tim. Yeah, if, if I can chime back in, um, that reminded me. Uh, so, for example, and I, uh, Dr. H kind of referenced my thesis, uh, but a lot of times uh, aspects are political in nature and then take on a religious guise, especially to mobilize and, and, and things like that. Um, and so a lot of times issues are actually political, but then um, they are transformed into a religious and what I call incorrect religious um, terminology and, and, and focus. And so like she was saying, like jihad, for example, just means an internal struggle. Um, but if you look at the media, you're, you're never going to like, you're most likely not going to know that. And you're going to equate jihad to extremism or terrorism. But honestly, it's just, it just means internal struggle. So the struggle to be a better person in your everyday life, not like what, what the media portrays or not even just the media because the media has a reason to portray it that way, right? There are extremists there out, out there. There are terrorists out there that, that pro proclaim um, terminologies incorrectly. Um, and, 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 and so um, it's, it's just the, yeah. Um, so 
uh, Islam is actually a peaceful religion. And in fact, in the Quran, it says, uh, he who kills one person, it is as if he killed all of mankind. He who saves one life, it is as if he saved all of mankind. Um, and so, um, yeah, just... Uh, Thank you all for those reflections. Um, I'm mindful of the time, and so I will, I will hand it over to Reverend Nicole, and I just want to extend uh, my sincere thanks to all of you for bringing, um, bringing your experiences, your lives, your perspectives, your expertise with us today um, to discuss uh, Islam, that is, is also written in the Quran, and the Prophet was rahmatan al-alameen, so brought as a mercy for all of the world and a blessing for all of the world. So thank you for sharing those dimensions with us. Um, thank you for being here with us and thank you to our congregation for joining us in our quest to learn more as we embark on these, on these journeys. So thank you and I'll turn it over to Reverend Nicole now. Jim, I'm not sure I can say it much better than you just did. It is such a gift and a mercy that you all are with us this morning and we're deeply thankful of your presence and your witness in this world um, to the God under whom we are united. So blessings to all. We do have a service we have to get to, too, but we're so glad that you were here and joined us today. Thank you. Thank Thanks you all so us. much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. I'll thank you. you. I'll send you personal <laughs> thank you notes later. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, my team. Bye-bye. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, Lynn. Have a good night. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.